seats in the presence of the living God. Hallelujah. We started a sermon series two weeks ago uh, called Being Human. Uh, we said that we started this sermon series because we must develop the skill in the church in this hour of turning the gaze of the scriptures onto the issues of day-to-day regular old human life. It's not that difficult when you do it well, but we've sort of lost the touch. And God is calling us uh, to minister in this time to the humanity of humans. So we spent two Sundays really focused on the body because we are body. We are Embodied souls, that's my working definition of a human. We are embodied souls with a spirit that's either dead in sin or alive in Christ. So don't let anybody convince you that you have a body. We are body. And we are soul. This week we turn our attention to a discussion about the soul. I would argue that there is perhaps no more important conversation for the church to have in this cultural moment than a conversation about what the Bible says about the human soul. I'll tell you why I think this is uh, so important. We are living in one of the most progressive moments in modern human history. give you some facts here. In 1972, men were 13% more likely to go to college than women. In 2022, women are 15% more likely to go to college than men. The sexual revolution is in full effect with 21% of Gen Zers, Gen Z adults identifying as LGBTQ plus, 21%, one out of every five Gen Zers you meet. New research indicates that 5% of all U.S. adults, 18 to 30, ident identify as gender non-binary. We're not just progressive on sexual issues and gender issues. Two out of three Americans tell Gallup that they feel connected to the cause of racial justice. Two out of every three Americans feel connected. Some of them, I don't know what the connection is, but they feel connected to the cause of racial justice. Even in the face of a generally significant inflation and with a congressional map that's gerrymandered in favor of Republicans, uh, what all the politicians and politicos were predicting would be this red wave has been hampered by one issue. And it is the fact that today a large group, almost a minority, uh, almost a majority I should say, of Americans believe that abortion should be available on demand at any point in pregnancy for virtually any reason. That one issue it's overcoming inflation, it's overcoming the gerrymandered map, it's overcoming everything. But with all of this cultural progressivism, economic inequality has grown in my lifetime at a higher rate than at any time since like the early 1870s. So we are progressive as we can be, but our economy has become more regressive than it's ever been. I love the way one social scientist put it when asked the question, why is it that this very progressive generation has not like previous generations that were less culturally progressive, those generations put together sustainable movements that improved the material quality of people's lives. 
this generation is way more progressive than those generations. But they have not put together a movement that sustains itself and, and, and improves the material conditions of people's lives. Yeah, well, they know how to go out. We can, and I'm not saying they because I'm in this generation. We know how to go out and like for like three weeks, you know, we'll make some noise and burn some stuff up. And, but three weeks later, we back in front of our TV screens watching what's the latest uh, streaming show, and it's all gone. One social scientist put it this way, and I love this. She says, how can you throw a brick through the window of a bank if you can't get out of the bed? This is why we don't have a sustainable movement, at least this one social scientist. She's saying, how can you go throw a brick through the window of a bank? How can you go be a part of the movement if you can't get out the bed? What she is pointing to is the fact that in the midst of this great progressivism, research from the University of Kansas concludes that modern Americans are increasingly overfed or malnourished, sedentary, sunlight deficient, screen addicted, sleep deprived, socially isolated and depressed. And what she's saying is some, these people are not going to sustain a movement. They can't get out the bed. Mental health is an epidemic. And we can get as progressive as we want to be. There won't be any movement. If nobody is well. Beloved, we have dismantled a lot. It was a lot that needed to be dismantled. I support, participated in some of the dismantling. But now our society and most of the people in it are just adrift. We've torn down the, the oppressive institutions. And praise God. But now we're just adrift. People don't even act out like they used to. We just checked out, adrift. Many progressives on the left are content to ignore this sad reality and celebrate the demise of these oppressive cultural norms. Many on the cultural left say, let's just keep dismantling stuff. Dismantle the family. Dismantle gender. Dismantle faith. Dismantle everything until it ain't nothing left to dismantle. But then you have a crowd on the conservative right that dream of turning the clock back to a time when women knew their place and men ignored their feelings and it was acceptable to hate and abuse and ostracize anybody who didn't fit the mold of a 19th and 20th century white western idea of society. Some folks want to just keep dismantling. Some folks trying to put it back like it was. It's a phenomenon that we have come to call the culture war. Well, beloved, I come to tell you today, I am a conscientious objector to the culture war. I refuse to participate on the basis of my beliefs. You see, beloved, I believe that we have to rebuild our societal structures. I'm telling you why it's important for us to reflect on the soul. We got to rebuild our society structures. But we can't just make them look like they used to look. The idea of the good old days is a lie. They are too old, and they were not that good. I believe that there is another view. I believe that there is a higher narrative. And I believe that it is found by rightly dividing the word of truth that we find in the scriptures. And so if we, beloved, have to rebuild our lives, 
if we've got to rebuild our families and we've got to rebuild our communities and we've got to rebuild our churches, we've got to rebuild our nation, if we have to lay a new foundation, then we've got to start with contemplating something foundational. And here's the foundational question. Who are we as humans? We've got to build something for us. First question we got to answer then is, who are we? From a biblical perspective, and many of the branches of philosophy and psychology agree, when you talk about human essence and identity, you're talking about what we call the human soul. The human soul, beloved, is the principle of biological life, the organ of thought and imagination and memory and emotion and will, desire, the seat of personality. The Hebrew word rendered for soul is the same word rendered for breath. The soul is what gives evidence to the fact that you and I are alive. The soul, beloved, is the quintessence of human existence. We live out of our souls. You see, we can talk about spiritual life, and we should talk about spiritual life, but when you sit down at the dinner table to eat some food and have a conversation with people, you ain't doing that out of your spirit. You got to come out of your soul. If we prosper, it is because our souls prosper. And if we languish, it is because our souls are languishing. So if we want to get society right, we got to get humans right. If we want to get humans right, we got to get the soul right. Are you with me this morning or am I by myself? That's all by way of introduction to why I think it's important that we talk about the soul. So as we continue this series, Being Human, I want to preach a sermon that gets us on the question, what does the Bible say about the soul? It's a sermon that contemplates this question. And so I called this sermon the question, what is man? What is man? As with previous sermons, I'm not going to try to attempt to provide all the answers on the subject of the human soul. That would be a fool's errand and a long sermon. So I'm not going to try to do that. What I want to do is lay down a framework for thinking properly about the question. Now, I think there's no better biblical writer to turn to if you want to contemplate the soul than David. No better group of writings to turn to than the Psalms. The Psalms are full of the soul of man. And there's a particular Psalm that I want to turn our attention to where David actually contemplates this very question, what is man? Psalm chapter 8 contemplates the question. I'm going to turn our attention for time's sake, to three verses in Psalm 8, Psalm 8, verses 3, 4, and 5. David writes this in Psalm 8, 3, 4, and 5. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? You have made him a little lower than the angels, and have crowned him with glory and honor. Out of this passage, we will observe four truths that the Bible teaches us about the human soul. I love this in in the psalm because it anchors and typifies what I think you would find if you do an exhaustive study in all of the Bible about the human soul. This text here anchors and typifies what we will find, and it'll go along with these four principles. Number one, the soul... The human soul is seen in the context of God. 
Number two, the human soul is sustained by connection with God. Number three, the human soul is sure through creation by God. And number four, the human soul is strong under a crown from God. Now, we're only going to get to two of these, so we're going to have to do it again next week. This will be a two-parter. We'll only address the first two uh, this week, uh, so this will be part one of the series. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity that you give us to look into the word of life. Thank you, uh, God, that you know our souls. You love us. You love our souls. I thank you that you caused our souls to love you back. We pray right now that the love relationship between creator and creation would manifest in this preaching uh, and that you would come and speak to your people by your power for your glory and our joy. We thank you and give you the hour. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. That's a proverbial hour. I'm not going to preach one hour. So the first thing I want to look at is the human soul is seen in the context of God. What I love about Psalm 8 is that Psalm 8 is about God. Psalm 8 opens up with David exalting in the majesty of God. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. David is is just going on and on about how awesome God is. And it is in the midst of these exaltations in the profound majesty of Almighty God that the psalmist begins to see himself. You see, beloved, you and I cannot see a full picture of ourselves. We cannot do that. You are always subject to you. You can never be object to you. You can be you to me, but you can't be you to you. You are always me to you. You can't be your own object. This is where we get the concept of an objective opinion and a subjective opinion. An objective opinion is seen as, as, as unbiased, whereas a subjective opinion is seen as biased because the subjective opinion is going to be inaccurate and full of bias because it's got limited perspective. It's too close. It's as close as close can be because it's me. I can't see the back of me. Because it's me. I can't step back enough from me to get a good look at me. And you can't step back enough from you to get a look at you. I can objectify this remote. Because I can step back from the remote and get a good look at it. If I were the remote, I couldn't objectify the remote. i always be too close. I would always be the remote. Are you with my mind by myself? So, if you look at the remote, you can see it. That's why I is what they call a non-objectifiable -objectifi pronoun. I can't never be the object. If I is in the sentence, it's the subject. Because I am always the subject when I'm concerned. I'm going somewhere. The biggest problem with modern personhood theory, which feeds much of modern gender theory, is that it puts all the pressure on you to define yourself outside of the context and with no input from anybody else. It puts pressure on you to define you. You don't, you don't, don't, it don't matter what what, what gender they assigned you at birth. You define you. It, it don't matter what society has been doing for the last 2,000 years. You define you. You don't got to be in the context of what other people did and what other people say. But, beloved, that's a lie. Because you can't see you like that. 
You can't know enough about you to define you any more than the remote can know enough about the remote to define itself. It can't step back and get a good look. We can never objectively identify ourselves. And because of that, there is no better context in which to consider man than in the context of God who created man. Somebody might say, okay, we'll take it. I can't define myself, but why I got to go define myself in the context of God? Well, an ant could objectify this remote, but it would take that ant a long time to get a full perspective because the ant is smaller than the remote. The ant's got to get too far back to see the whole thing. Once it can see the whole thing, it's not close enough to get the details right. By the time it gets close enough to get the details right, can't see the whole thing again. So an ant, while it can objectify the remote, can't really get a good perspective. See, blood, if you want a good perspective for you, you want to find something bigger than you. Put yourself in the context of something bigger than you that can see you. Beloved, your high school experience is not big enough to be the context for how you define yourself. Your childhood trauma, Mike went out, the devil, your childhood trauma is not something that needs to be dismissed. It's something that needs to be confronted and dealt with, but it is not big enough to be the context in which you define yourself. Your little six years of academic study and your PhD, it is not big enough a context in which to define humanity and even one human. The memory of and the legacy from your ancestors, it is profound and it is beautiful, but it, that's just one ancestral history. It is not a large enough context to try to get a definition of a human soul, beloved. It is only in the context of the awesome, mighty glory of the infinite creator of all things in the presence and the context of God is where you want to try to get a perspective on humanity because God is the only context big enough to get a good look at man. This is why our society struggles, beloved, because a person or a people who will not declare the glory of God will never comprehend the essence of mankind. Let me say that again. A person or a people who will not declare the glory of God will never comprehend the essence of mankind. Beloved, man is incredibly complex. I have thoughts and feelings and passions in my soul that I can know objectively. I can know my passions and I can know my feelings and I can know my thoughts and I have a body that I can know objectively. I have a body that I can touch stuff with and I can speak with and I can reach out and touch somebody. But in the midst of my feelings and my passions, my emotions, my thoughts and my memories, my body and my connections, something down on the inside of me says that these are only a part of me. These are what I am, but they are not who I am. You see, beloved, that is where the, the, there's some truth in, in that gender thing because what they are doing is connecting to what we won't say. All this stuff around you, that's just the what of you. It's not the who of you. There's a deeper question. There's a who on the inside that's not defined by the color of your skin or where you grew up or what you have and what you don't have or what you went through. There's a who in there. And we are too complex for simple definitions. Sunday school is not a big enough context to describe and try to get a definition of the human soul. Are you with my mind by myself? There's a who on the inside of me, and there's a question burning what or who is great enough to step back and tell me for real who I am. 
And beloved, if the church is silent, then somebody practicing African spiritualism or, or Buddhism or some other kind of uh, psychological humanism will step in and say, I got a degree that is high enough. I got a theory that is high enough. And, and as one of my favorite movies says, when somebody is thirsty and, and they are having an illusion, they'll get so thirsty that they'll think they'll drink the sand. Beloved, lies prosper in the absence of truth. It's in the atmosphere of the glory of God that we begin to realize that God is the one great enough to tell me who I am. This is why I've been spending so much time working in our worship ministry. Why? Because I just like good music? No, I mean, I like good music. But we got to be able to create an atmosphere where people can get in the presence of God. Because it is in the presence of God that people begin to realize God is big enough, great enough, strong enough to tell me who I am. Tell me for real who I am. It's when we get through the doorway and find ourselves in the presence of God that we begin to contemplate with David, what is man? The human soul. can be seen objectively only in the context of Almighty God. The second point we want to look at, and it's our last one for today, is that the human soul is sustained by connection with God. You see, the psalmist here asserts something about the essentials of the relationship that God has with mankind. The psalmist says, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you visit him? Now, it would not be profound after declaring the great just to then contemplate the judgment of God, the kingship, the rulership of God. These would seem to be natural outflows of declarations of the glory, the majesty, the strength of God. But what flows out of the psalmist, the prophet David, is not, God, you are a righteous judge, and he is a righteous judge. God, you are a glorious king, and God is glorious king. But God, you are a caretaker to mankind. David says, what is man that you are mindful of him, that you remember him. What is man that you, in all of your beauty and your majesty and your infinite wisdom, you think about me? What is that? What is man that you visit him? Make a search for him. Take a look at man. Take care of man. David is asserting that the essential relationship that we see with God, at least in the essential relationship, is that God is the great caretaker of humanity. I'll say something that might come as a little bit controversial in our time. Nobody cares about people more than the God of the Bible. Now, bad theology on suffering has warped that truth. And we're going to do a sermon on human suffering. Because people ask, you know, why do bad things happen? And Christians faint, don't have an answer. By the time we get through with this sermon series, we'll have an answer. But bad theology on suffering warps that. A warped view of God. We tend to look at God through a warped view uh, and, and define God as, as like a human man in the context of human masculinity. God is a tough guy, but God is not in our 
definition of masculinity. And God is not a big bad God waiting to see people suffer. God is the greatest caretaker of mankind. It is a significant theme of the Christian scriptures. Highlighted in the gospel is a portrayal of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as the world's supreme soul physician. You want to know how to speak into this moment, beloved? Just look at the English word psychotherapy. It's all over our culture, right? Psychotherapy. Psyche from the Latin root where we get soul, at least the Greek word for soul. Therapy, therapeu, to heal. Psychotherapy is an attempt to heal the soul, which I would argue is a pretty good definition of the impact of salvation on the life of a man or a woman. Look no further than Jesus' own description of his own ministry in Luke chapter 4. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to captive, recovery of the sight to blind, uh, to bind up the brokenhearted, to set uh, free those who are oppressed. Jesus is the first and the greatest psychotherapist that there ever is. More profound, I think, than God's desire to heal the soul is God's care for individual people. You see, God is, is not this general, non-specific God with this general, non-specific love that is sort of a comprehensive plan that covers everybody, one size fits all. Jesus tells his hearers that the hairs on their heads are numbered. That he's watching over the sparrows. And you are worth more than many sparrows. Jesus, the prophet, tells his hearers. Not Jesus, but the prophet Isaiah tells his hearers how God knew you before he knit you together in your mother's womb. Every single individual God is connected to and concerned with and inclined toward your individual life and your individual stuff. God is not looking at you as part of this big group. He's looking at your soul, dealing with your stuff. It's not a generic, general care. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he's watching me. Beloved, God cares for the human soul. The human soul is sustained by our connection with God. The great solution for much of what ails the souls of men and women is renewed connection with God. When we first came to this location, this building that you're sitting in right now, it was COVID. The building was closed. But I still came a lot and worked in the office. And in the middle of, you know, prayer and study, sometimes, Pastor Vince, you'll say amen, it's good to step away from it because God will work some stuff out. You wrestling to get a question answered, you can't get the answer. When you step away, then God will drop it on you. So, I used to go downstairs, because downstairs in this building, there's a little youth lounge, and there's a little basketball hoop down there. It's down there right now. Well, that's the new one. We got a new one. It was one down there that didn't work. But I would go down there, and I would shoot baskets to let my mind do something else, part of my thinking process. So when they put the new one in, kept doing the same thing. I would go down there. I would shoot baskets. I would clear my mind. One time I was down there shooting baskets, and my kids came down there and plugged that joker into the wall and cut it on. <laughs> and it started counting my baskets. 
and facilitating competitions between us. Corbin B. It was it was saying good job and you know it was doing a whole lot of stuff because they plugged it in. You see, beloved, you are a living soul. But your living soul has to be connected to what the Bible calls the life-giving spirit. Your human soul, you are a living soul, and can't nobody take your humanness away from you. But a human soul unconnected to the life-giving spirit is like that broke basketball thing. I could shoot baskets on that thing. Couldn't nobody take away its basketball ness. It was a basketball ring. I could clear my mind shooting baskets on that basketball ring. The nets were intact. If I shot right, I could hear the... But it didn't turn on. There was a capacity to do some things that that thing couldn't do because it was not connected. It couldn't connect. The believer is like me with the fixed one. I got a, a brand new one. It's got the cord on it. Electric bills paid. There's electricity running through the wall. But somebody with a revelation had to come and plug that thing in. I had grown so comfortable playing on a broke one. Y'all don't hear me today. I got so comfortable playing on a broke one, they put a fixed one in there. And I kept playing with it like it was broke. Never plugged it up. I'm, I, I'm trying to count my own baskets. This thing will count the baskets for you. But somebody with a revelation had to come along and say, Daddy, won't you plug it up? <laughs> Beloved, you got your soul. Can't nobody take your soul from you. That's the problem that the church has been running into from the time of the conquistadors till today is that we want to dehumanize anybody who is not a believer. You can't take nobody's humanity. You can't take the imago Dei off of them. They are living soul with the image of God stamped on them, whether they believe what you believe or not. But what we have is that connection to the life-giving spirit that can plug in and turn on and do some things that the broke one can't do. That's the ministry of the church. Paul summarizes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, be reconciled to God. Reconciled. Connected again. That's the message of the gospel. In Jesus, get connected to God. If I can take two minutes, I wasn't going to go here, but we want to go here because I want us to become a missional church center. So I'm going to take two minutes and I'm going to close up. But I'm, I, I want to talk about this. You see, one of the things that we run into in the church is that we're supposed to be a connection center. We're supposed to be folk to provide a pathway to God. But sometimes we don't want to be a pathway. We want to be a proxy. What, you, what, what people need is a connection to God. But we like big offerings. So we want people to be connected to this church. I don't care if you get connected to God. Come in the building. And then church becomes a proxy for God instead of a pathway to God. Church membership is not a proxy for God. Church membership has to be a pathway to to God. If being a member of your church is not a pathway to God, then membership in your church ain't worth a thing. Church attendance is not a proxy for God. It's supposed to be a pathway to God, 
But if your church service don't get people connected to God, then it ain't worth nothing. We are called, beloved, to be pathways to God, not proxies for God. You don't need a preacher. You need God. And if my preaching is not getting you to God, my preaching is benefiting you nothing because I can't be your God proxy. You got to get connected to God. You don't need Prophet Chris. Prophet Chris is only good as a bridge. Walk right over me and get to God. Listen, beloved, I'm saying this about us as a fellowship. I don't ever want us to try to be a proxy for God. We got to be a pathway to God. This me is not the most important. Me as a preacher is not the most important. Our singing and our music is not the most important. Our programs and pro groups and Bible study, those are not the most important. Those are pathways. People should pass on through and get to God. But we want people to get stuck up in our face. You don't need to see my face. You need to see God's face. There ain't no fullness of joy in my presence. People who are really close to me will tell you, if you stay in my presence too long, the joy is going to run out. Ain't no fullness of joy in my presence. Do that mean I'm not going to visit if you're sick? No, no, no. We'll visit. But the visitation is not a proxy for God. The visitation is supposed to be a pathway to God. If I come and visit you and all you got was a smile and a hug and a handkerchief, Beloved, this is, this is not part of the, the, the notes, but we have to be beyond ourselves, over ourselves. Don't nobody love the church more than me. I always say this. Some people here may love this church as much as me, but don't nobody here love this church more than me. But because I love the church, we got to get past the church. The end goal can't be you in the church. This is a step on the way. The, the preacher's posture is not come over here to me. The preacher's posture is this way, y'all. Keep on moving. I'm going to go back into this. I believe that it's time for your soul to be seen. I got two more points in the sermon, but right here, we can leave it here. It's time for some souls to be seen. First off, it's time for you to see your soul. It's time for you to to see you in the context of God. We live in a generation that is struggling to understand ourselves in the context of a lot of things. Technology and social media put us in the context of everybody in the world. We're trying to figure out in the middle of all this stuff that's going on, Who am I? It's time for some souls to be seen in the presence of God. I believe that as we become skillful in bringing folks into the presence of God, it will become manifest to them. God is the one great enough to show me me. All of a sudden, the Bible is not a book. It's a mirror. Showing us ourselves. It's time to pursue the glory of God and pursue worship and pursue the scriptures and pursue prayer and pursue Christian fellowship. Not as a proxy, but as a pathway to God. So that 
you can begin to see yourself. One of the marks, I want one of the marks of Chicago Embassy Church Network, and I pray that one of the marks of the church in this generation would be that we become known as people who know who we are. Beloved, you don't got to walk around guessing who you are. We know the God who can tell us who we are. And I want us to be seen. But it's also time for us to be seen by the soul physician. Some of us haven't been for an appointment in a long time. And it's time for your checkup. Some of us walk around with a lot of bruises and wounds on our soul. Because we haven't been to the soul physician. Some of us are walking around with too much pain on our content because we have not been down to the great soul physician who can put on that balm that the Bible says ought to be in Gilead. It's what the prophet said. Is there no balm in Gilead? If there is balm in Gilead, the prophet is implying there ought to be a solution for the people. Beloved, there is balm in Gilead. We just got to go be seen by the great soul physician. What I love about this physician is that this great soul physician is like the old physicians down south. He makes house calls. I believe that some of us we hide when the doctor come knocking on the door. Act like we're not home. Because we've been tricked into thinking that God is coming to judge us. Uh, that God is coming to, you know, tell us about ourselves. Set us right. But, beloved, God is a nurturer. God's a caretaker. We've been doing too much God is tough guy. Now, don't get me wrong. God is, is still the, a mighty battle axe and, and, and a sovereign king. But God is not just a battle axe and a sovereign king. God's a nurturer. God's a caretaker. God can come in and bind up your wounds. God can come in and hold you a while. There have been a, a few times I'm, I'm in my seat, but I'm coming early. I'm still early in my parenthood, but we've been through a few things now. Great-grandmother passing away, have to move out the neighborhood. Been through a few things with my children that I couldn't fix. They were sad about it, and I couldn't fix it. And so all I could do was hold them a while while they cry. It ain't that God can't fix it. Because there have also been times where I could fix it. But I knew it was better to just let it play out. So instead of fix it, I'm just going to sit with you. I'm going to hold you. Let you cry a while. God's a nurturer like that. God will hold you and let you cry a while. If you go see the great physician, some of us think that God is, we treat God like the dentist. We don't make appointment for the dentist until something goes critically wrong. And even then, we still, we just terrified to go. This physician, beloved, he's a psychotherapist more than a dentist. He's got a comfy couch. I'm not making this up. This, Jesus says in, in Matthew, come unto me, 
all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'm not making it up. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Somebody needs to go see the great physician this morning. The great soul healer, the, the psychotherapist, Jesus. I'm in my seat, but I, I urge you to stand up this morning. If, if you're here today, first off, you're here, you're watching online, you don't have a relationship with Jesus. I said it in my definition. This is what humans are. We are embodied souls with a spirit that is either dead in sin or alive in Christ. If you don't have that relationship with Jesus, you are like the broke basketball thing. You got a spirit, but it's dead in sin. This Bible says. But you can be born again today. That spirit inside of you can come to life. Get reconciled back to God, the life-giving spirit. And it's not super complex. That's what I love about the basketball thing. It ain't complex. A seven-year-old fixed it for me. And it's not hard for you. Just like it was for me, the electric bill is paid. The life bill, not the light bill, the life bill is paid. Jesus already died on the cross. He already paid for all of your sin. It's life running through the walls right now. All you got to do is plug in. How do you plug in? The Bible says it's super simple. Believe in your heart the Lord Jesus. God raised him up from the dead. Confess that with your mouth. You'll be saved. I don't have a connection with Jesus today. I want a connection with Jesus. Everybody's standing on their feet. I want Jesus. Heads bowed, eyes closed for this moment. I want Jesus. You stick your hand up. You don't want to stick your hand up, stick your phone up and get this QR code. You're watching this online. Get that QR code. Just scan it. I want Jesus. Beloved, if you don't have him, you're not connected to the life-giving spirit. I want him. I want Jesus. Right now. Put your hand up right now and I'll see it. We'll pray with you. I think I see one hand back there. If you're online again, text this QR code. We want to pray with you. We want to connect you with some resources. Again, we are not trying to be a proxy for God. We want to be a pathway to God. see that one here. Maybe you're here, you're saved, but you need your soul to be seen. Maybe you need to get in the presence of God so that you can see you. You got too many questions about you. You need to expose yourself to the presence of God where you can get some definition about you. If that's you, beloved, I encourage you right now, this is a good spot to begin to do what I call practicing the presence of God. One of my favorite things about church meetings is that it's a great place to start learning to practice the presence of God. 
We got an anointed musician right now. You're not going to always have an anointed musician. But you can learn how to pop on a... I was going to say pop on a, a tape, but nobody has tape. Nobody has CDs. Play music with your phone. Anointed YouTube. And use that as an opportunity just to begin to focus on God. Maybe say something to him. You're so good. You're so worthy. It's not just like this. Reading the Bible. It's not like reading a textbook. It's practicing the presence of God. When you get real good at it, you'll put your music on and then read the Bible. Then start praying. As you start to do these things, beloved, I want to promise you this. That's how you get yourself in the presence of God. The Bible urges us that we come into his courts with thanksgiving, into his presence with praise. You do these things and you get there in the presence. And what does the Bible say about the presence of God? Right there in his presence is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, pleasures forevermore. This is the Bible, beloved. We're not rewriting the script. This is the Bible. We just got to understand how to turn the gaze of these scriptures onto the stuff that you're going through. If that's you, you want to practice the presence of God, I want you to just lift your hands up to him right now and practice his presence. I urge you to close your eyes because people look different, sound different when they're doing their thing. But it's just like we preach. God wants a personal relationship with you. I know how to do my thing. But God does not want to hear you do my thing. God want to hear you do your thing. You say what you say. I'm going to keep saying what I say. But God wants to hear you do you. For him. He knows that you are different from me. Everybody else in this room can practice the presence of God, give, offer God praise and thanks. And something is missing until you start adding yours. And beloved, if, if God is getting everybody else's in this room, he still wants yours. Mine don't replace yours. Even if I get loud with it, it don't replace yours. God wants you. Why? Because he just wanted to hear you? No, he wants you in his presence. He wants to pay you a visit. That's what the psalmist says in Psalm chapter 8. He's been thinking about you. You know how it is? I promise I'm in my seat. But somebody haven't been around in a while, especially church people, we do this big time. Somebody haven't been around for a while, we start to say to each other, have you seen so-and-so? God is thinking about you. It don't matter who else has been around. He's thinking about you. 